Now, we're going to talk, once we get the furniture up here, we're going to talk about uh, the transformation of the next tech hub. But the transformation of this tech hub started a few years before Emerge Americas, something called the Americas Venture Capital Conference. Does anybody remember that? How, is anybody, was anybody attending that one? We did three years of that, first at FIU, then at the JW Marriott, and I forget what the third year was. But Emerge Americas came along and has really supercharged this whole momentum of building a tech hub in, in Miami. Um, we have three speakers joining us as soon as we get the furniture out here um, to talk about this. Um, first of all, we have the Senior Vice President of People at Magic Leap. And everybody's very familiar with Magic Leap, the extraordinary company that's here in South Florida. We also have the president of Florida International University, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. And we have the best-selling author of Exponential Organizations and founder of the Fast Track Foundation, uh, Salim Ismail. And, and to moderate the session, we have the CEO of Emerge Americas, Javier Gonzalez. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Thank you guys. Good. Good, good, good morning good. again. How's everybody doing so far? There you go. At least we got one, <laughs> one guy who's all hopped up on coffee over there. Good. Uh, so welcome once again uh, to day two of Emerge Americas. You know, I'm so, uh, so excited about the panel discussion we're about to have here. Um, and it's really centered all around uh, emerging innovation ecosystems, right? And, and it's not just about what's happening here in Miami, but we, wanted, we do want to kind of refer to Miami uh, as a case study of, of what we're seeing. Uh, but given this kind of stellar group that we have with us, we really want to focus around uh, the idea of talent and talent really driving a lot of the innovation that we need to see and driving the development of these ecosystems. So we're going we're gonna to jump right in. I, I, we have, again, such a, an esteemed group of speakers. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we use every second uh, to get all of the knowledge we can out of, out of all of them. Uh, so obviously we have, again, the, the president uh, of Florida International University, uh, Dr. Mark Rosenberg. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, the gentleman with the favorite title I've heard so far, the head of people for, for Magic Leap, Carlos Benzini. And, uh, and the, the co-founder of Singularity University and also the founder of uh, Fast Track Institute, Salim Ismail. Yeah. Thank you. Again, thank you gentlemen all, all for, for being here. So, so let's jump right in. So, so Dr. Rosenberg, I'll start with you. Um, you know, obviously from, from the Florida International University perspective, uh, there's been a significant amount of investment uh, right. across the board right. on, on obviously developing talent, but starting to get more and more into the innovation space, more into right. the technical space, everything from the College of Engineering and the, the number of engineers that you're graduating on an annual basis, uh, your focus around projects in cybersecurity, startup FIU. I mean, there's, there's been a lot going on, and especially over the last five or six years, right. so, so that's been great. Um, what are you hearing as you kind of talk to your private sector partners about what are the needs that they have today and how is that evolving? And then I think that the second part that I want to make sure that we address because I think it's, it's something that people don't necessarily always think about in the development of talent is what are the obstacles that you're facing in, in as you're trying to meet the needs of this private sector? Well, I, I'd say that there are three drivers here of the discourse. The first is diversity. The absence of diversity in the workforce, particularly in the tech workforce, is a major issue uh, and, and in this country. Uh, FIU speaks to that, uh, but perhaps we know we can do better. The second is the, the issue of skills gaps, the fact that we're graduating students that don't necessarily have the skills that industry needs, and uh, the, the urgent need for training and retraining in areas uh, that are specific to the organizations who we're trying to hire. Those are challenges. Uh, what, are the, what are some of the obstacles? Some of the obstacles are uh, the unwillingness, let me, let me deal with the, the, the external part first, the unwillingness or the inability of the private sector to step up and take some responsibility, the, the fact that getting the talent is a shared responsibility. Because if you see one job out there, you see one job. It's very difficult for a university to train to that level of specificity. We like our internships, we like apprenticeships, we think they're important, 
but we need partners. So on the external side, the willingness to take responsibility. On the internal side, the inflexibility of curricula, the difficulty that accrediting agencies have for thinking out of the box and getting into the 21st century, uh, and if you will, mindset. Mindset of, of faculty, mindset of administrators, mindset of individuals who are moving uh, at an analog speed when we need digital speed, when we need exponentiality, we've got to do a lot better uh, internally as it relates to that. We have to reinvent ourselves. And I'm proud of the fact that, that I think you can find that at a lot of universities, certainly at ours you can. I'm happy to talk about that later. Yes, no, please, we'll definitely get into to more of that. So, so Salim, obviously, from the Singularity days, now with what you're doing with Fast Track, uh, you've seen so many different innovation ecosystems and you're seeing things that work and things that don't work. Uh, so give us a little bit of a sense of, of what do you see, for, specifically from the talent side, what, are, what do the organizations need to do and what do ecosystems in general need to kind of bring together to develop the kind of talent that will help an emerging ecosystem like a Miami but uh, so many others around the world? So I think what's something really important that's happening is the game has changed. In the past, you would hire based on certain skills and certain knowledge and certain expertise, and the deeper, the better. Right? Right. But today, uh, you know, you talk to Sebastian Thrun, uh, who created the Google car, and you ask, how do you hire? And he says, I hire you for passion and I hire for imagination. I don't hire for experience, I don't hire for skills, because a lot of the roles that we need today, uh, the, the skills don't ad ad match to that at all. Right. And that navigation is, I think, what Mark is dealing with, is how do you transition to both the private sector and the public sector thinking? Uh, almost all, everything I do today is solve, focuses on solving what we call the immune system problem. If you try disruptive new innovation, the antibodies attack you, and you end up in this vicious cycle of, of kind of it gets diluted so much that nobody can recognize it as innovation, and you get stuck in this loop. And so we work very hard on breaking that cycle in a lot of the work we do today. Interesting, that's great. And so, and so Carlos, I think obviously it's, it's funny hear, hearing Salim mention imagination uh, and passion. I, I could only imagine that that's what you're seeing every day at the folks that are coming to Magic Leap. And, and so for, I think one of the interesting things, obviously many in our audience uh, uh, have heard the story of Magic Leap. I think they, they obviously hear a lot about the, the dollars invested and in all of that kind of thing. Um, but I think one of the other underlying stories which has really been interesting, again, from an ecosystem development perspective, uh, is the talent that you're looking for, right? So it's not only uh, talent that you're looking for right here from the local community, but also it's a, such a highly specific, such a technical talent uh, that you're bringing it from all over the world. So one of the other sides of, of the development of talent in an ecosystem uh, like Miami um, is your ability to attract talent mm -hmm. and your ability to retain that talent once it, once it comes into town. So talk a little bit about, you know, what are you facing? What are the challenges you're facing in attracting that talent? And then also, I guess, kind of to start uh, start getting a little bit uh, controversial, if you will. What are, what are the challenges you're, you're putting in front of folks like, like Dr. Rosenberg and FIU about what do they need to do to make sure that you don't always need to be stepping outside to, to find those, uh, those yeah. positions? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna stand on the shoulders of uh, Salim in terms of uh, passion. Um, we have uh, had over 100,000 people apply for jobs at Magic Leap. And we do screen specifically for passion, people that, that are on board with the mission. Um, you know, paraphrasing Nietzsche, it's, if you give somebody a good why, they'll figure out the how. We've been able to move folks from all over the world, and obviously a lot from uh, the West Coast, to South Florida. Because when they share passion for the mission, uh, and we're mission-oriented, uh, they'll jump, they'll move their families, they'll move their kids, they'll, they'll plant roots here, and, and uh, because they're aligned with our mission. Right. Um, by the way, our mission at Magic Leap, um, it's to uh, harmonize technology and people. Uh, right now, technology might be separating us. We want to unify the world. Uh, a little bit what uh, President Fox uh, mentioned yesterday yeah. on unifying the world, and, and that's our mission. Obviously, we're building a spatial, personal spatial computer. When people come, and we've had thousands of people visit us as candidates or as investors, and when they uh, experience it, they're ready to join. Yeah. So uh, if you give people the right mission and they share it, they'll, they'll, there won't be a barrier. Right, and, and so now that you've both kind of referenced passion, I, I guess 
how do you how do you quantify that? Like, how do you find that person that sits down and says, you know, I want to desperately work for for Magic Leap, or I desperately want to change an ecosystem and work with Fast Track and in, in doing something? How do you how do you gauge that? How do you select someone based on passion? How, how does that how does that process work? I think the one of the things I wrote this book a few years ago on how do you build fast scaling companies, and the core uh, instrument in there, a technique, was a, what we call the massive transformative purpose, or the MTP. Uh, harmonizing people with computers or technology or Google organize the world's information. And when you put out a statement like that saying, here's an aspirational outcome that we're going after, then the people that match to that will naturally find you. Right. And so that you don't have to do the push work and convincing them. You basically uh, set up your stand and say, this is who we're, what we're about, and then they'll find you. And the second part about the passion side is I think one of the huge advantages around Miami is the pa latent passion. I, I'm Canadian, there's not a lot of passion in Canada. Right? <laughs> so, so there's an enormous advantage that this region has with the ecosystem here that can be really leveraged to a huge extent. Right. And, and so Dr. Rosenberg, I, how do, I guess, how do you teach passion? You know, how, how do you train uh, the students to get them passionate about uh, that, that career, that, that vision that, uh, that either they share with a company or they should be searching for in, in their pursuits? <clears throat> Uh, well, first of all, passion, I'm not too sure it's taught, but I think it can be encouraged, it can be brought out in people. Most people want meaningful work. Most people uh, want a values-based environment in which to operate. And I would say that, you know, here in South Florida, and in particular in my experience at, at, the, at the public university where I've been privileged to work for a long time, is that our students uh, have a sense of urgency, uh, which is akin to passion, not quite the same, uh, they're also very, very determined. And thirdly, they've seen work. They understand work. They've been working, 85% of our students work full or part-time, so they get that part of it, and they get the urgency of having to work to support their families and to make a meaningful life. But I do think it's got to be values-based, and it's also got to be meaningful. Right. And, and so, so one of the things, so talking about, you know, this, this passion, right, that's, that's kind of inherent here in... in and I, and I would think in the, in the region, right? So kind of Miami, you sure. talk about Latin America, and, and there's that hustle. There, there, there's a, a certain amount of that passion. And I think one of the things that I've heard referenced a couple times from is the diversity side of it, right? So yeah. there, there is this natural diversity uh, in Miami, which is, and, and greater Miami, if you will, uh, that's, uh, that's so critical to, to everything that makes us unique, right? So, so from, you know, Carlos, from your perspective, you know, how much are you guys thinking about diversity, uh, not only obviously gender, but nationality and, and all of the different aspects that, that have to do with, with diversity? How much does that play a role in what you guys are thinking? It's probably my top one uh, objective and goal uh, or MBO uh, to drive for diversity and inclusion because it's not only about the numbers, it's making the numbers count. Yeah. Um, we are very fortunate to be headquartered in South Florida because we have tons of, of diversity. Uh, we're lucky that there have been previous efforts uh, you know, in technology here in South Florida. I mean, people talk about South Florida as an emerging technology hub. Um, when the man left for the moon, it was from Florida. When you know, the PC was uh, manufactured, it was here in Florida. The iconic cell phones that Motorola make, they make them down the road. Um, so, so there is a lot of uh, industry and, and ecosystem here, and obviously it's natural, the diversity uh, here. Obviously, um, we're not happy. Uh, it's never enough, as Dr. Rosenberg mentioned. Um, we're trying to incentivize as much as possible diversity in the engineering schools. Uh, if you look at the numbers on LinkedIn, uh, out of the 1.3 million developers out there, software developers, only 19 are women. Um, the world is not 19%. Um, the world is 50-50 or 51-49. Um, we, in, in, in tying it back to what we're doing, um, we're building a product for all consumers. And that should reflect the market. That should reflect the diversity of the market. So, so again, it's the number one uh, priority on the people side. Yeah, and, and so one of the things I, I also, you know, in, heard you say, Salim, is, is this idea of, of the immune system and, and trying to battle that immune system as you're trying to bring in innovation and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the education system, uh, and I think you know, Dr. Rosenberg will probably agree to some extent with this, is, it, and he's referenced it, right, is, is how do you battle that within the education system to make sure that that talent is understanding and also that the organization is understanding the kind of innovation that needs to come out of it and develop the talent accordingly. You know, right. where, where, where do you see that, 
kind of that analogy coming together in the education side of it? It's a huge problem because it's structural. Uh, you know, when we think about this immune system problem, it's really a function of size of organization. As you get bigger, you have to put more controls in place, you have to put, and that control and that structure forms like the skeleton, and it wants to be that thing. It, it, all our organizations are built for efficiency and for predictability, right. uh, certainly in the past. And the bigger the organization, the more efficient, the more predictable you want to make it. And we're seeing a different heuristic now when we see these new companies, they're operating in very loose, decentralized org structures. And so we try and match that, uh, bridge that gap between old legacy, say 20th century hierarchical structures and what's coming. And it's one level of difficulty in corporations. Uh, uh, government is a whole other level of difficulty in order of magnitude, right? Because they're the, in the public sector, the existing policy is the immune system. You right. look at Uber and the taxis, the tension there and so on. But academia is a whole other deal uh, because you try and update academia and that's, a, an or, I think, a Nobel Prize is due over here for the work that Mark is doing trying to update that organization. Um, and I'll give you a couple of very easy examples. Uh, a, a fascinating two, uh, from my time at Singularity, it, tur it turned out that even though we had the leading scientists researchers, thought leader in the world coming to speak, uh, we could not become an accredited state-sanctioned official university because to do that you have to fix your curriculum and not change it. And our curriculum was updating in real time. Right. Right. Yeah. Right? And that's a structural issue. Uh, or if you were doing today a master's degree in neuroscience or advanced robotics or biotech or any of the topics that we cover there, uh, literally by the time you finish your master's degree you're out of date because our ability to teach a subject cannot keep pace with the changes in the subject area anymore. And so how do you even think about it? We have to redo the entire system from the bottom up. And yet if you try something, it'll, you'll get this attack and you get, you get stuck in that, uh, in that discussion. And so really we, we have a really enormous challenge, but conversely a huge opportunity to rethink our, mo most of our institutions from the ground up. Right. Uh, so, Dr. Rosenberg, you know, right, right back to you, right? It's, yeah. it, it, how are yeah. you battling the immune system? So, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not pessimistic at all. Uh, I, the first thing that has to happen, particularly in higher education, is that we em embrace a, a language of convergence, understanding that vocational career and technical and baccalaureate are going to converge. That's the first thing. And that's beginning to happen, the conversation nationally on apprenticeships, earning and learning programs is starting to happen at a serious level. Uh, the second thing that has to happen is that we have to begin to go from degree programs to competency-based education programs and make and understand that while people may not want to be students all their lives, they'll need to be learners. And there's no better place to get those skill sets than at a university or a, at a state college which takes responsibility for that area and, has a cutting it, and, it, and is at the cutting edge. And I, I'm confident that we can break down those barriers in the process. Now, here's what has to happen. I think there's got to be a lot more pressure from the business community. I think the business community overall has to raise its expectations for what we can and should be doing. I think the business, part, the business community, uh, and I understand that's a very broad category, has to find ways to build partnerships that are win-win. And uh, I see that happening. I see progress there. So I'm, I'm cautiously uh, optimistic. And eventually, where universities will end up is, yeah, there'll be degrees that we will be offering for those few traditional learners, the 18 to 22-year-olds, uh, that their family members want to get them out of the house and things like that, but uh, that the university will have found a way to speak to adult learners uh, that provides value, connection, and meaning that, that adult learners still were, are going to need in their lives. Right. And uh, so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. It's going to take 10, 12 years, and there's some other things that have to happen in the midst of that, but I see those starting to happen. So I'm not, you know, in a fetal position, cursing the darkness, worrying about these changes. We're finding uh, faculty leaders in the in our university and universities around the country who get this, who want to move forward. And so I'm, I'm pretty confident that, that we're going to survive and thrive in this new, uh, much more aggressive, exponential, rapidly growing knowledge economy. I am. I'm, I'm optimistic about that.
Yeah, that's the, well, that's the kind of view I think we, we definitely need from the university leaders. And, and so one of the other aspects, I think, and as you talk about this kind of concept of constant learning and con yeah. continuing to drive that, uh, and I guess it's, it's another part of the immune system that, that you, Dr. Rosenberg, are battling, is, is how that's tied to some of the support you receive from, from government, and how does, right. that, uh, how does that then drive kind of continued investment into the programs and into the things that are going on. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because that, that to me is a, such a big external obstacle uh, that we're facing well, here and, and, and quite yeah. frankly is, is being faced all over the world. I mean honestly that is trench warfare uh, because the regulatory frameworks uh, and, the, and the status and, and prestige frameworks are privileging uh, tradition, they are privileging systems that might have been good 20 years ago but aren't going to sustain themselves 20 years into the future. And so I think, those, I think it is the case that those institutions that are younger, that don't drag around a lot of baggage, are going to be more successful because they're not benchmarking against the past, they're benchmarking against the future. I think those institutions that are urban, uh, the, that are in thriving metropolitan areas, whether you know, it's here in South Florida or elsewhere globally, I think they have an opportunity to really lead this march because they're going to much more intimately understand the human workforce uh, nexus that, that is there. But it is trench warfare now in terms of the regulatory frameworks because the regulatory frameworks are essentially set up by the traditional institutions so that they can continue to, if you will, uh, be the masters of those frameworks. Yeah. So, so Carlos, uh, um, a little bit earlier we were, we were talking about uh, just the sheer number of applications you're getting and, and all of that. And, and, I, and as I referenced at the beginning, um, Magic Leap has made so much news uh, and a lot of it driven by the, the, the amount of investment and, and, and that those capital dollars coming into the business. So from that perspective, how is that playing a role? Because in, any, in the development of any emerging ecosystem, um, and, and particularly uh, what you hear in, in a lot of them when, when you're talking about what are the challenges, there's talent and then there's the capital side of the, of the house. Uh, but, but not necessarily how do those two things play together. So from your perspective, how, how does that equity that you're raising uh, impact your ability or create challenges in your ability of, of, of recruiting the right folks, of, of developing that talent? So, so we, uh, uh, I want to tie it back to values. Um, we recruit a very um, specific type of individual, not only for the technical skills, for their passion on, on the mission, uh, but also on, on the possibility of changing uh, the landscape in computing. And obviously, uh, as an early stage, you know, uh, privately funded uh, uh, startup, uh, that's part of the uh, attractive uh, uh, aspects of, of these folks, right? They, they want to go and change the world, and obviously, they, they, uh, it's not a big, you know, very stable company, but, but a, you know, exponentially growing company. Right. Um, our number one investment above all investments is talent, is people. Um, and uh, we, we, you know, in order to attract the best in the world, you have to, you know, pay for the best in the world. Um, we've been lucky enough to, to move hundreds of families to South Florida, but we also have uh, 10 or 11 offices in, in other places. Um, and, and, you know, folks that want to join this, uh, this tribe uh, do it for a mix of factors, including the factor that we're, you know, capitalizing in certain ways. Yeah. And, and so, Salim, from, from your perspective on that, that equity side, how much is that driving the development of these ecosystems? Does it, does it help to battle that immune system? Is it getting entrenched in it in some of the more established ones? I mean, is that an opportunity for the emerging markets to come up? Do you mean the diversity side? Yes. Uh, it's actually a huge uh, plus. You know, uh, major breakthroughs always happen when you cross disparate areas together. And all innovation and creativity comes from taking something from one frame of reference to another and applying it and mashing it together. And that's the root of all scientific discoveries. So basically, if you don't have diversity, you're not going to be creative or successful or innovative in any way. So that's the starting point. So you add to that the creativity and the passion, things get really interesting. And I think the really, uh, what's, what gets me excited about Miami as an ecosystem is the incredible proximity to all sorts of different places. It's an easy hop to Europe. It's an easy hop to South America. It's an easy hop to the West Coast. And I think people come here uh, enjoying the benefits of this area, and then you get the talent and the passion on top of that. I think this is the most interesting ecosystem in the world today. Uh, and the potential is just, it's just starting. 
And I think the opportunity exists here to reinvent a lot of our old institutions, whether it's um, education systems or how we think about uh, transportation or education or political systems and others. I think they, they can do some really interesting work there. That's why I'm based here. Yeah, and, and clearly all of that, what you're saying is music to my ears because that's, uh, that's what Emerge America is all about, obviously, that proximity and, and bringing all of those folks together uh, at one place uh, at, at one time. So what are some of the ecosystems that you look at that are uh, case studies, things that can be duplicated that you see you know, in other parts of the world uh, that you know are maybe obviously not uh, identical to, to what can be accomplished here, or or what should other ecosystems be looking at as as case studies of what they should be striving for? So the the traditionally the one that's been furthest ahead has been Silicon Valley, uh, with a couple. And we don't think about replicating the ecosystem because they're very unique to the local geography, right? Just as an example, Hollywood as an ecosystem for movie making became the heart of movie making because there was so much natural light that you could run a movie camera. Yep. Uh, it wasn't because of anything else. And, and only now, because we have artificial lighting and other things, you can do that elsewhere. But at the time, it was just easier to do it there, and right. therefore it started. And the same way with Silicon Valley, it started on that characteristic, and it's been based and grounded there. But I think there's a couple of characteristics that are very powerful to think about. One is uh, the acceptance of failure as a learning environment. I think one of the secret weapons that Silicon Valley has is that when I was living there for eight years or so, you don't relate to <coughs> failure as, as a failure of the individual or even the company, you relate to it as experience. And you go, oh, there's an, and I'll tell you a quick story which I think was Please. quite fascinating. Um, I was researching for my book, uh, uh, people that had tried multiple times. For example, very few people know that the founders of Google made 350 different investor pitches before they got funded. Now, you need to have passion for your project. Yeah. What if they'd stopped at 340? Right? Yeah. And how many other founders have stopped just before they should have, et cetera, et cetera? And so that's a really key thing about uh, not, never stopping, just keeping going and, and going after it. And there's, a, there's a, um, an entrepreneur who'd failed seven successive times in venture-backed companies, and number eight was a billion-dollar company. And I went and talked to the VCs who'd funded him on attempts five, six, and seven, and said, why did you invest in him? Uh, he failed five times in a row before right. you got to him, and then you invested in him four times in a row. Uh, and because most parts of the world, you'd never get to two, right? Uh, if you here try to build a business, you fail twice. There's no way anybody's giving you any money. And that's the same for most of the part of the world. Mm -hmm. And the VC's answer was pretty amazing. He said, one thing we know about that guy is he will never stop. He is never going to stop. And one at some point, he's going to succeed. We want to be there when he is. And, and that mentality is something to learn from. And I'll give an, an easy example if you want to take this on. Have a risk takers award here in, at Emerge next year. Find the three people in the ecosystem that took the biggest risk and failed and put them on stage, have them shake the mayor's hand, give them a prize, and you'll change the relationship that we have with taking a big risk and, and potentially failing. Because people in most parts of the world are scared to fail. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, a key hallmark of how you build an ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you. And I say that as somebody who's failed a ton of times, so I, I can speak from experience. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's, it's, such a, it's such a strong point because also I think that's something that's, uh, again, kind of somewhat inherent in, in a Latin culture where that, right. that fear of failure and what does it mean about that person and all of that, uh, where, where you're starting to see that change. I mean, yeah. I think you're starting to see some of that, so I love that idea of, of, of bringing those risk takers. Uh, you, you don't need to see uh, uh, much go, go much further than our own founder in, in terms of the risk takers. In, in the Valley also, two Valley transplants, um, it's, a, it's a badge of honor. It's like, yeah, I tried this, I failed, but you, you learn much more from the failures and, and the wins. Yeah. I'm about to launch a cryptocurrency, and everybody's looking at me, you're insane. But that's how you learn. You've got to try it and see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Dr. Rosenberg, we're talking about, obviously, some of, uh, some of the uh, ecosystems to emulate. How do we right. start picking some, some good things here and there? From, from an institutional perspective at FIU, what are some of the, the other schools you're looking at? Some, but not only schools, but I, I think what's interesting is programs. Yeah. Programs that aren't necessarily in the traditional educational institution perspective that, that you guys are implementing and you're trying to do some of those best practices to, to again, elevate the level of the talent that's, that's being produced. Well, I'll give you one. The data is out there that if a student gets an internship, they have a 60 to 65 percent likelihood of getting employed by that company at a, at a premium of ten dollars to $12,000. The data is very clear on that. So with the other educational institutions in Miami, we created the Talent Development Network, which is a portal where students can enter their material, their, their, what they're interested in, 
and where businesses can then identify where they can get interns to, to work for them. And that's been uh, very, we've had so far about 250 students who have gotten those internships and now have gone on to, to much better jobs. So some of it you have to think out of the box. We started a, uh, a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in the Internet of Things. I think it's the first in the country. In some respects, you, you, have to, you have to benchmark against where you want to be, not where everybody else is. Here's a question I've been asking to, we have dean candidates uh, for law school uh, coming in. And I, you know, I, here's my question. Uh, how many of you are teaching uh, cryptocurrency law? You know, where, you know, where is the, the legal education around cryptocurrencies, or around blockchain? That's going to be completely necessary, and everybody is, not, is ducking on that. So, I mean, you know, you have to be out in front. Let me go back to one question, if I could, about Please. how do you get that, how do you teach passion? Uh, a lesson I learned a while ago in the public policy arena, because, you know, most of us are, if you will, scientists, we're trained, we're formally educated, and so therefore our thinking is that reason drives emotion. Well, increasingly it's clear for those of us who thought that was the case that that's not the case. It's emotion drives reason. So my instinct about that is if we can do a better job of, of making sure that our students have great, uh, if you will, uh, training, formation in emotional related issues, whether they relate to psych, uh, through psychology or other, other forms of practical experience to deal with the range of emotions, I think we're going to do a lot better at the issue of passion. In other words, passion is great. Passion is a major driver. But that's not exactly how we, how we go about our curriculum. Let me tell you what, what in, in, in my thinking is in terms of how our students get their determination, their passion. If you have to come across 836 every day to get to FIU, all right, and usually it's wall to wall yeah. most of the time, and you graduate right there, that should be an immediately qualifier for somebody who's willing to take risk, who's got determination, who's hardworking, and who wants to get to their goal. Yeah. And that's what we have in abundance, which I'm proud of. So, so Carlos, I, you know, before we... we I, ironically, we just finished a project with the mayor to solve the traffic problem. So let's see if, if we, we still have that problem. They're battling with them, right? Uh, so, so Carlos, I, the, the president has talked a couple of times now about... It. Uh, internships yep. and, and apprenticeships. How much is that playing a role in what you guys are doing? It, very important. Uh, every year, and you know, we're about to start the summer with a class of around 60 interns. Uh, most of those folks graduate uh, students at a, a very diverse set of disciplines from you know, deep learning, optics, photonics, and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, um, uh, law. Um, we have the highest conversion rate in the company for any kind of a group from those interns. Uh, we bring them in, we screen them obviously, we bring them in for a full summer, they do real work, they, they know exactly the types of problems that we have that, need to, that we need to solve, and after the summer we know exactly how they'll add value and contribute, so we want to expand that, and I'll probably talk to Dr. Rosenberg backstage on how to do more of that. Great. Well, and and so, Carlos, when, when you look at the, how that breaks down, where are you bringing all of this? Are, are these kids coming from local uh, universities? Are they coming from around the country? Are they coming from around the world, around Latin America? Where, where are you finding these interns? Where are they all coming from? Yeah, um, it, broadly, uh, we go to around 30 schools uh, in the U.S. We, we, you know, from obviously on the technical side, we go to MIT and Berkeley and Stanford and Harvard. Um, incredibly, um, most of our full-time employees are from, or the top five schools that we recruit from are local Florida schools. Their number one is FIU. We have uh, plenty of folks from, from FIU, and we want to uh, increase that. Uh, we find that the, the mechanical and electrical and computer science folks are, are top-notch. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big mix. Um, we uh, do go out and recruit from specific professors, not even schools or, or you know, colleges, schools, but specific professors in, in some, some of these uh, disciplines. That's great. Uh, so, so we have a, a, just a couple more minutes here, and, and I want to wrap up uh, with one question, and I'll open it. You guys can, can go in whatever order you want. Um, what do you see for the future? Right? So what, what, is, what do you see, Salim? Obviously, you're, you're investing here. Magic Leap is, has been so 
prominent in saying South Florida is where you want to be and you want to be a part of the growth of the ecosystem here, and obviously FIU is a pillar of that growth. Uh, where do you see us in five years? Where do, you, where do you think we're going to be with all of the things that we're doing today to get us to that next stage? You're asking me? Uh, one of you want to go first? Sure. Open it. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> go for it. I'll so, go last. So I have a map in my office with all the tech companies in South Florida. Um, it's impressive. When, when you actually list them and see them on, 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 uh, uh, on your wall, it's impressive. I know that in five years, that's going to be you know, four or five times that. Uh, we want to encourage a big and diverse ecosystem of technology here in South Florida, from you know, other companies being in our value chain to companies uh, 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 you know, in different sectors. Um, and uh, I know we're trending towards that. Uh, relevance, impact, and value for higher ed, for our institution. Uh, I see us going more and more to personalized education pathways. Every student, because of intrusive measures of cognition, will be on their own distinct pathway that will either be curated or they'll be essentially doing it themselves, but we will provide that value. And um, uh, an institution across time that is, uh, that is a go-to institution locally and globally for people who want to solve problems. So, Salim, besides fixing the traffic problem, what else do you see in the next five <laughs> years? Um, so, I think there's, a, there's something very big happening globally that's important to recognize. And as I travel around the world and kind of meet global leaders and heads of state and company CEOs, uh, I'm seeing kind of four major things happening today. Number one is uh, technology is a forcing function in the world. Uh, in, the in the 15th century, we had the Gutenberg printing press, and that completely changed the world. I would argue today we have like 20 of those hitting us at the same time, because just blockchain changes everything, right? Then you add in drones, then you add in autonomous cars, then you add in solar and AI and robotics and biotech, and the list just goes on. And so I think we have 20 of these Gutenberg moments hitting us. Num that's number one. Number two, that breaks every institution. Uh, our democracy is breaking in front of our eyes. Intellectual property is fundamentally broken. Education is struggling mightily to keep up, et cetera. Uh, that's the second. The third is that our existing leaders aren't cut out for this. Especially on the political side, all of our leadership is trained in incremental, predictable, stable, material, scarcity-based thinking. In the world, right. the train is pulling into black swan central, right? right. Um, and the fourth one, I think, is as, I, is, as we have this uh, ob observation that now everything is happening down at a local city ecosystem level. And so we have to essentially, if you believe any of that, we have to reinvent all of our institutions from the ground up at a city-based local community ecosystem level. Awesome. And I think this is where uh, an interesting ecosystem to do, this is why I'm investing with Rocker Fuel uh, EXO here as a fund, uh, because this is the, maybe the most interesting place. And, and it's not even an opportunity. I think it's an obligation, mm -hmm. because what's about to hap come mm -hmm. in the world in the next 10, 20 years is nothing like we've ever seen before. Great, great. I want to thank you all so much for being here. Please give us a good good nice job. warm round of applause. Thank you, thank you so much. Great, nice, man.